These are the conflicts of interest that I'd like to disclose for this talk. I think that we have touched upon the fact that we have very high sodium intakes. So this is just another way of looking at that. Um, in blue here you will see the upper limit for sodium and then the, red, the orange or the red are really what the American diet is currently. So you can see on one side is for males and on one side is for females, but the far deviation from the upper limit recommendations in where we are. And so this is data that's a little bit older, so what I'm going to do is update some of these figures and findings in, in our work. Sodium and potassium are two critical minerals that have consistently been identified as nutrients of concern in the American diet. Although health professionals continue to express concern over high sodium, potassium intakes also fall very short of the recommendations. So it's important not only to examine sodium, but also to examine potassium. And that's because recent data suggests that the sodium to potassium ratio is more strongly associated with increased risk of hypertension and cardiovascular disease than either of these nutrients alone. And so you've seen these figures and these estimates here before, but these are the recommendations for sodium and potassium and what that would look like if we had an ideal ratio of these in the diet. And some work, historical work that Adam Drunowski's group did showed that the American diet has never had an average below 0.8. And you'll see these targets for the recommendations are about 0.57 or 0.5. So we're really far from that recommendation. And this is important because the sodium and potassium ratio, as I mentioned, is more closely associated with risk. And that isn't to say that sodium doesn't have an independent risk and potassium doesn't have an independent risk, but the magnitude of risk associated with the ratio is higher. And so this is a, a paper from Yang et al. showing NHANES data from NHANES 3 and linking it to 15-year death index data. So these are the hazards ratios for all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, and ischemic heart disease mortality. So you can see a greatly increased risk of death from these factors when the sodium to potassium ratio was above one. So for that reason, we wanted to update these findings. We wanted to look at what is the current sodium potassium ratio, what are the current mean intakes of these. We wanted to look at who's meeting the recommendation for 1.0. We wanted to look at differences between race, age, and sex, and what types of foods are contributing to the sodium and potassium ratio. We use data from the National Health and New Zealand examination survey, or as we call it, NHANES. I'm just going to take a minute to explain this to you because the next presentation in this series is also going to be using this data. So NHANES is nationally representative survey data. It's been cont continually collected over time. We are showing you data in this presentation from 2011 and 2012 in which data was collected through two 24-hour dietary recalls. As Dr. LeBay alluded to, not only do we get sodium in low sources from a lot of foods, but we also have certain foods that are really high contributors that are not as frequently consumed. For, so th for that reason, we always want to get at usual or habitual intakes. So this slide might look a little confusing, but the take home message from this is that there is measurement error when we use a 24 hour recall. And for that, there's a lot of within-person variation or random error. So using the NCI method to reduce measurement error to the extent possible is what we did to get at usual sodium intakes. And this takes into account things like day of the week, because certain foods consumed on the weekend are much higher in sodium, like pizza in the U.S. tends to be consumed on the weekend. So if we just looked at estimates from the weekdays, we wouldn't really be getting the most habitual or usual intakes. 
So I'm going to start to show you some data now. This is just the mean energy intake across different age groups. And this is all in U.S. adults. And just to give you a sense of where sodium is relative to calories and then also potassium. And so in this slide, I'm just showing you the means of sodium and potassium for different race ethnic groups. And I'm going to summarize on the next slide the key findings, because in this slide, I'm showing you men and women combined as a group. But we did find some interesting things when we separated the group. So even within sex, intakes of sodium decreased and potassium increased with age. Asian men and women had the highest sodium intakes when compared to all other race ethnic groups. In men, white and Asian males had higher potassium intakes than either blacks or Hispanics, and black women had lower potassium intakes than all other race and ethnic groups. So there's tremendous racial variability in the intakes of sodium and potassium in U.S. adults. Regardless, 90% fail to meet the sodium targets and less than 3% meet the potassium targets. So now we're going to be moving on to looking at the sodium to potassium ratio. And in this slide, we see the mean of that for all adults by age and by sex. So you can see that I told you sodium went down with age and potassium increased with age. So you can see that clear trend emerging here in the sodium to potassium ratio. In this, slide of this, um, in this side of this slide, I'm showing you the percent of Americans below the recommended 1.0 ratio. And you can see how that changes for men and for women. So these are the estimates of less than the recommendation for the ratio. This is a little hard to see, but these are the means by race ethnic groups in the U.S. And then here, again, the compliance by race and ethnicity. So overall, 16% of white individuals had intakes um, at the recommended level. And you can see how that changes for men and for women. So overall, the take-home findings from that series of slides is that only 12% of adults have the sodium to potassium <laughs> ratio for cardiovascular disease protection in the United States. That was significantly higher in females, so there was higher compliance with females than males. And among all of those who met that recommendation, the largest proportion were among non-Hispanic white adults, but still that was only 16%. This slide is showing you all Americans age two and older. So this is not the data that we prepared in our analysis, but just to give you a sense, as Dr. LeBay alluded to, sodium comes from many sources, but in the US, it's by and large coming from mixed dishes. And what that means is things like hamburgers, sandwiches, tacos, grain-based dishes, rices, pasta, pizza, things like that. So that's really the major driver of sodium in the American diet. Only a very small portion of sodium for most Americans is added at the table. So that's an important point for this section. What I'm showing you here is the amount of sodium that is contributed by certain food groups by whether or not you are meeting that sodium potassium ratio. So you'll see that in the red line, 37% of the sodium among those not within the recommendation is coming from these mixed dishes. Whereas among those who are meeting the recommendation for potassium, they're coming from non-alcoholic beverages, so primarily fruit juice and things like that. But what's interesting is that those who are meeting the recommendation also have higher intakes contributing to potassium for vegetables and milks and dairies. So this is an important way to look at the data. Where is the sodium coming from? In this next slide, what I'm showing you is the percent of the groups who are consuming these food groups. So for blue, these are people who are meeting that sodium to potassium recommendation. In red, these are the percent of consumers among those not meeting the recommendations. And so the take-home message from that 
is that among those who are meeting the recommendation for the sodium to potassium ratio, they're less likely to consume mixed dishes and condiments. Everyone consumes mixed dishes, but they consume them less frequently and in lower amounts. And that is because they're having more vegetables, more milk and dairy, and more fruit. And so it's important to have this context because when we have cross-sectional data like we have with the NHANES, sodium-potassium ratio is also associated with having this better overall dietary pattern. And I think that's what I would like to leave you with is, is this concept that meeting the sodium-potassium ratio means having a diet that is higher in vegetables, milk, dairy, and fruit. With what I presented today, there are some strengths and limitations that we need to discuss. So a strength of this is it's a large nationally representative data source. It's the first year of collection where non-Hispanic Asians were included. And so we learned some interesting findings from that in differential sodium patterns among Asian Americans, whereas they are adding more sodium at the table, whereas other race ethnic groups are consuming it within the food groups. Our estimates in this do not include discretionary salt used at the table. So not from a salt shaker, but if someone's adding soy sauce or ketchup, that's included in this estimate. There's always measurement error when we're talking about self-reported diet. So the reason that we use the National Cancer Institute to reduce the within person or the random error is something that we can easily address. However, there's always a systematic bias of energy under reporting that we cannot address with self-reported dietary data. But I did want to show you that the USDA automated multi-pass method that is used to collect the 24-hour recalls in the NHANES survey is validated for energy and for sodium. So from carefully controlled studies with doubly labeled water, we know that energy under-reporting <coughs> using this method in the U.S. under-reports energy anywhere from 3 to 11 percent. But what's interesting in relative to sodium for this talk is that the ratio of sodium consumed or reported to be consumed relative to that in the urine was quite high, so 0.93 for men and 0.90 for women. Another study called the OPEN study or observing protein and energy gives us a sense of the extent of underreporting for potassium and sodium. So for potassium, it was anywhere from zero to 4%. That's really good in terms of measurement error in, in the work that I do. For sodium, it was higher from four to 13%, and then the ratio from sodium to potassium falls somewhere intermediate. So the big picture, my take home messages, I think a consistent theme that you'll hear here and in other sessions is that we do need to have a reduction in sodium, but we also have to have increased strategies to increase potassium intakes. Increasing potassium rich foods while reducing the intake of high sodium would inevitably improve the sodium to potassium ratio. And so I think some easy targets from the work that I presented here today are focusing on mixed dishes and condiments. Healthy overall combinations and patterns of food and nutrients rather than simply focusing on sodium reduction and isolation I think is the optimal strategy for moving the field of health forward. So thank you for your time and consume some bananas because they have a lot of potassium. <laughs>